Good morning. Always good to be here with you. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how many of you remember, but one of the great segments on The Tonight Show way back when David Letterman and Jay Leno were doing it was the person on the street segment. I don't know if you remember that, where the host would go out on the streets of New York and ask peop random people really questions they really should know, right? If you remember that, I mean, they were questions that, you know, the random person should know. I mean, um, Lena would ask questions like, what's the highest mountain in the world? Or where is Canada? Um, or, you know, what causes a rainbow? And the part of the fun was just seeing the really bizarre answers that people would give, but it was also kind of painful, wasn't it? Um, uh, yeah, so I was wondering if we did a person on the street, if we went out into um, the streets of Greeley at some point um, and asked people this question, who are the people of God? What kind of answers might we get? I mean, we might get answers like this, Baptists, Anglicans, Catholics, Israel, Biblical Israel, the Church of Jesus Christ, Americans, Kenyans, Germans, Koreans. We might get an answer like anybody who claims to be a Christian or anybody who is spiritual or anybody who m meditates or we might even get answers like anyone. We're all the people of God. They're pretty diverse answers, aren't they? And some of them have elements of truth, and some of them are fairly far from what Scripture describes. The people of God, that term and that identity that goes with that term has a rich and meaningful history in Scripture. But the term has been used in ways that are sometimes inconsistent with how Scripture uses it. Now, if you do a concordant search on the term people of God, you actually only come up with a couple of instances where, you know, that particular phrase is used. But if you add in, you know, his people or God's people or other variations of that term, there are hundreds of references because the idea of a group of people attached to God with an identity that is defined in relationship to God is woven throughout the Bible. It's everywhere. We find both in the, New, the Old Testament and in the New Testament, that idea is permeated. It, it's permeated by the presence of a group of people whose identity is determined by their relationship with God. You know, in the Old Testament, the people of God is more clearly Israel. And being the people of God meant certain things. There was identity and relationship and purpose, all inherent in what it meant to be the people of God. And in the New Testament, we see significant continuity between the God, God's people in the Old Testament and the New Testament. There are the same rich elements about identity and relationship and purpose that continue between Old Testament and New Testament, between Israel and the Ecclesia. Yet there are significant differences between the people of God in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So this morning, I want us to spend a little bit of time defining what it means to be the people of God. And let's see if we can answer that um, person on the street question in a way that might be more grounded in both Old and New Testaments, and in a way that might be a bit more faithful to the word. We're gonna look at the why, the how, and the who of the people of God and see what is the same throughout scripture what is continuous, and then what is different because of Christ in the New Testament. So let's start, you ready? When God brings an enslaved people out of the place of their suffering, he gives them a new identity. In Exodus 6, verse 7, God is talking to Moses about how he will rescue the Israelites, and he says, I will free you from being slaves to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my people, 
and I will be your God. The Israelites were already a group of people with some shared characteristics. At this point, they were mostly one ethnic group, although not exclusively. They were a West Semitic people. They all shared the experience of suffering under the yoke, under the oppression of Pharaoh and of Egypt. They also already had a shared history of God's promises to them. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob each had a promise of God's blessing and a promise that God would take their descendants and make them into a nation. So that promise was given and reiterated to each of the patriarchs. Yet in this text, we hear that God's stating that after their rescue from Egypt, he would take them as his people and he would be their God. After their deliverance, they would become God's people. So what does that mean? I mean, centuries before, God had already made a covenant with Abram and promised him a nation. So what did it mean at this point that the Israelites become God's people? Well, I believe the answer is hidden in Exodus 19, verses 3 through 6. I think those verses give us an answer. And we've talked about this passage before, but I think it is so significant that we're going back to it this morning. So Exodus 19, 3 through 6 says, Then Moses went up to God. This is after they've been rescued from Egypt. At the foot of the mountain, Moses goes up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. Now, this text outlines three main elements of what it meant for Israel to be the people of God. The first is that out of all of the nations of the earth, Israel would be a special possession. This phrase is a royal term. It's used to describe the valuable possessions that a monarch, a king would have. Um, and Israel is, is termed a special possession with this value and this worth. Israel would be valuable and special to God. They would be different than any other nation, even though the whole earth belongs to God. The Israelites who were brought up out of Egypt would have a special relationship with God, not because they had done anything worthy of that relationship, not because they had earned it. They had a special relationship because of the next two elements. Israel was to be a kingdom of priests. Priests mediate between people and God. And in the ancient world, priests were the go-between who brought sacrifices to the gods on behalf of the people. So for Israel, as a people, it meant in some way that they were to help mediate between God and the nations around them. They did have priests within the nation, but the nation as a whole was called to be a kingdom of priests, to mediate between God and all of the ancient people groups around them. Now the way they were to do this was to be set apart. That's the final element. The final element is the how of being God's people. They were supposed to live in such a way that the people groups around them would be drawn to Yahweh. They were to be a holy nation. So when God says to Moses, after delivering, delivering the Israelites, he would take them as his people and he would be their God, this is what he meant. To be the people of God meant they had a special relationship with him because they had a special mission and purpose. To be the people of God meant to be set apart for the sake of others, to live in a way that was so different and distinct that others would come to know the Lord God was the Lord of all. In Deuteronomy, Moses reminds the Israelites of this in his sermon to the people as they stand on the edge of the promised land. 
Moses is warning Israel about idolatry when they get into the land and about adopting the practices of the people around them. When he says in chapter 7, verse 6, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the people's on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession, right? This is Moses using the same language, reminding them about their identity, their relationship, and the purpose. Then at the end of Deuteronomy, Moses leads them in a covenant renewal ceremony where they hear again the law that God has given them and which will enable them to live in a holy and distinct way, a set-apart way. And Moses says, be silent, Israel, and listen. You have now become the people of the Lord your God. Obey the Lord your God and follow his commands and decrees that I give you today. Moses says, you have now become the people of the Lord. Why now? because they are on the edge of the promised land. They are on the edge of the context in which they are to live out the law and be a holy nation, distinct from everybody else. They are on the edge of their mission. And as they enter into the land, they enter into their mission and start to live out their purpose. And so the now you are the people of God, their identity is so tied into the mission Moses reminds them that to be the people of God means to follow God and live in a way that reflects him and is different than the people around him. Not just to be different for different sake, but to draw others to God. Now, throughout the rest of Israel's history, the identity as God's people is reiterated and celebrated. Israel understood this. They were his people. They had a special relationship to God because they were chosen for a mission. Psalm 95, 6 through 7 says, Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. And Psalm 103, know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. They celebrated their identity and their mission. Now, unfortunately, right, Israel forgets this part. They forget that they are God's people because their special relationship is one of purpose. They forget that to be his people meant to live a holy and set apart life. And because of this, they become just like the other nations around him and they experience exile because of their idolatry and the injustice that comes from the idolatry. But the mission doesn't go away. The identity of God's people is not void. Listen to the words of Jeremiah in 31, verses 31 to 35. Jeremiah says, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. And we read those words in Jeremiah and we talk about the new covenant. We look back on these words after the cross and the resurrection and we understand that the people that God is is being established are a people who experience forgiveness of sin and have the law of God written on their hearts by the Spirit. We understand that this people that God is establishing is a people that is oriented around Jesus Christ. In fact, the writer of Hebrews quotes this same text in his teaching and his discussion of the new covenant. The people of God has elements that are the same as Israel. And yet, this people is different. So what changes, right? What changes about the people of God? What's the same when we get to the New Testament? 
and post-Christ. Well, the Apostle Peter, the one who has such trouble in the Gospels, right? The one who voices every thought and jumps to action without thinking. The one who passionately follows Jesus but is also vehemently denies him. This Peter is no stranger to what it means to be the people of God. He's also no stranger to how this identity stays the same and changes after Christ's work on the cross and his resurrection and ascension. In Peter's first letter, he's writing to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces. He's writing to Christians who have been persecuted, who are scattered all over Asia, and he draws on the same language from Exodus 19 to redefine who the people of God are now. In verses that are probably familiar to you now because we've been putting them up on the screen for the last several weeks, um, it, the, it's in 1 Peter chapter 2, he reminds the church, the ecclesia, and Peter says who they are. He says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you had received mercy. See, he reclaims the three elements of Israel's identity as the people of God, and he attaches them to those who are in Christ Jesus. The special relationship, the purpose, and the mission of Israel continue in the age after Christ. But the people of God has now been expanded the church, the people of God, has an even more valuable relationship to God. They've received mercy, forgiveness of sin through the atonement of Christ. They have been called out of darkness and into light through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the mission is still the same. The people of God are still a royal priesthood with the mission of drawing others to Christ by the way they live. The people of God are still called to be a holy nation, set apart as a community of God that shines so brightly in the world, that shines the light of Christ in everything they say and do. Peter takes the identity, the imagery, the mission of Israel and draws a line to the followers of Christ. Now, we've seen some of the threads of continuity, right? The idea of identity and relationship and mission. But how has the people of God changed? Well, the Apostle Paul gives us a clue in 1 Corinthians 1, 2. It says, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Paul is writing to a church filled with Gentiles who have come to Christ from a variety of pagan and mystery religions. These Gentiles were not a part of the people of God, but the Holy Spirit made clear to Paul after his conversion and then clear to the disciples later that this expanded people of God crossed the barriers between Jew and Gentile. In Romans, Paul says that the Gentiles were grafted in to the believing Jews, right? The Gentiles are grafted in to those Jewish Christians, and together, they are grafted together, and they become the people of God in the New Testament. Listen to Paul again. He says, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Yet Paul still refers to this new community as God's holy people. The language of mission and purpose is still there. In fact, Paul quotes Leviticus 26, 12 in his second letter to the Corinthians, as Donnie talked about last week, when he says, for we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God 
and they will be my people. He's drawing the identity and mission of the people of God in the Old Testament. He's attaching it to the followers of Christ, both believing Jews and Gentiles grafted together. The whole book of Ephesians unpacks this reality. In Ephesians, Paul is addressing the divisions and the tensions in the church at Ephesus over ethnic differences. Ethnic division is actually the presenting issue in the Ephesian church that Paul writes to and writes about. His whole teaching in chapter two is about the reconciliation that Christ brings. He says things like that the two shall be made one. The dividing wall of hostility has been abolished. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross. This is the amazing, astounding, powerful change to the people of God. All those who believe, all those who call on the name of the Lord make up the people of God. This means that the church, the ecclesia, the people of God now in Christ is a multi-ethnic, multinational, global community that has the same purpose and mission to be a holy nation, to be priests and peacemakers and reconcilers for the sake of the world. This is an otherworldly truth. The idea that believing people from every tribe and tongue and nation are now knitted together into one people is nothing but miraculous. I mean, the world cannot replicate that. And as the world continues to splinter into factions and whether those factions are based on significant and important characteristics of humanity or whether they're based on superficial things. The people of God is a family that brings together people of every shape, size, nationality, personality, and economic status. And according to Paul in Ephesians, this truth, the truth of reconciliation between humanity and then between humanity and God is in fact the mystery of God's will. In his words, the mystery of God's will is to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Now if we were a little more expressive church, Maybe this would be the point where we would all stand and cheer and give verbal thanks to God for what he's brought about and for the miraculous nature of the church. But I don't want us to give thanks. I'm sure you're all giving thanks in your hearts, quietly and silently. But I don't want us to just give thanks without talking about what this really means for us in day-to-day -day life. This is not just an abstract concept. The reality of the church has to have daily implications. It has to change the way that we go about life every day. That's what I want us to talk about for the last few minutes. What does this really mean for us? We've established that the church, the ecclesia, is constructed of people of every race, ethnicity, nationality, personality, economic status. We're knit together, built together. Together we make up the temple where God dwells. Together we are a holy people who reflect the character of God to the world. Together we are a family. Together we are the bride of Christ. So when we read scripture about how we are to live as the church, these verses mean all of us. When we read the commands to you in scripture in reference to the church, which Donnie pointed out last week is primarily corporate, it's a second person plural, it means the whole people of God. Every congregation of believers in every corner of the world, whether that is across town, across the country or in another country. Now that we've established this and we affirm who it is that we are cemented to, let's be reminded of some of those words to us as the people of God. 
Colossians 3, 12 through 14, says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you have a, has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Did you catch the echoes? First, Paul reminds the church of their identity as holy and chosen people. This incredibly beautiful and diverse body of Christ together is chosen and set apart as unique, set apart to be obedient to God through Christ. Paul is talking to the church. It says every day, just like we put on our outfits for the day, we are to choose to put on, to clothe ourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forgiveness, and love. And remember, that's not just a command to live this way to the people in the church who you like or who you agree with, or who look like you. These commands are for the church, the global, ethnically diverse, socioeconomically diverse people of God in Christ. So the compassion and patience and forgiveness we are to exercise is towards others at Cornerstone. But it is also towards believers in Boulder and believers in Birmingham and believers in Seattle, South Korea, China, Mexico, Rwanda. These believers, no matter where they are in the world, are our brothers and sisters. They have the same identity as we do. We share God's presence with us. We share the blessing of Christ. And because there is one body, one Lord, and one spirit, we extend forgiveness, compassion, patience, and love. Because that is how the people of God live. That is how we live a distinct and holy life for the sake of the world. I wanna read one more text about how we are to live as the people of God in all of our richness and in all of our breadth and beauty. And as I read this very slowly, I want you to picture other churches, other believers. I want you to picture followers of Christ gathered together in the open air, under trees, sitting on blankets. Believers gathered in beautiful sanctuaries like ours and in school buildings, storefronts, and in homes. I want you to picture gatherings of Christians from Native American, Asian, African American, Hispanic, Northern European descent. I want you to picture Christians gathered together in red and blue states, rural, and urban areas. I want you to picture Christians who drove to church in luxury cars and Christians who are gathering after sleeping on the street. Are you picturing? Now let me read words you've already heard this morning, but listen to these words with those images in your mind. Love must be sincere, hate what is evil, Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. 
Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Mourn with those who mourn. When one part of the people of God, our family, hurts and mourns, we all mourn. When our brothers and sisters anywhere suffer and mourn, we don't ignore them. We mourn with them. We come alongside them and we work to help and heal. When one part of the people of God rejoices, we rejoice with them. We don't denigrate or belittle, but we rejoice. We love, we serve, and we share with those in need, no matter where they look like, where they live, what they look like, who they vote for, or what they wear. The next time we are watching the news or reading the paper about people suffering or experiencing something painful or unjust, think about the church there. Think about your brothers and sisters in Christ who might be a part of that. We are called to cry and mourn with them. Be devoted to one another in love. And likewise, the next time we hear of a community rejoicing over something, think about your brothers and sisters in Christ who might be a part of that community. Rejoice with them. Be devoted to one another in love. So in answer to the person on the street question, who are the people of God? The people of God are the most colorful, most economically diverse, most geographically distant, and the most amazing family on the face of the earth. The people of God are Jews and Gentiles grafted together through the Holy Spirit because of Jesus Christ with a special mission for the sake of the world. Amen? Amen. Will you pray with me? Father, I, I want to start with rejoicing and giving you thanks. In Christ, you have done something amazing. You, through the Holy Spirit and through the work of Christ, have given us the ability to be one body, an incredibly beautiful, diverse, distant body that is united in mission and united in our relationship with you. And for that, we give you praise and thanks. And Father, we ask for your forgiveness for all the ways that we have hurt other people in the family, the other ways we have hurt people in the body of Christ. Forgive us, Lord, for not mourning with those who mourn, for ignoring their suffering and their pain, ignoring our brothers and sisters. Forgive us, Lord, for not being devoted to them in love, extending forgiveness and patience. Lord, we ask for a renewal among us. Anoint us with your Holy Spirit that we might live in a way that is holy and set apart from the world and the way the world works, that we would model this devotion to one another in love that we would rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn, that we would come alongside to heal and to help, to serve and to love. Father, give us the courage to do that. Give us the energy. Give us the love to do that. And we ask all of this in the name of Christ. Amen.